Hey everyone, this video is the first part in a series I'm calling The Tricky Parts of Calculus. This series is all about the points of calculus that are subtle, difficult, confusing, usually glossed over on a first pass through the subject. In this first video, I'm going to be establishing the properties of the trigonometric functions sine and cosine. Let's consider the most natural and historical definition of sine and cosine as functions parametrizing the unit circle. In calculus, we shift our perspective from the original notion of sine and cosine representing ratios of sides of right triangles to being functions of a real variable. The set of points in the xy plane that are distance 1 from the origin is called the unit circle and may be given as the set of points that satisfy the equation x squared plus y squared equals 1, that's by the Pythagorean theorem. The ray that makes angle theta from the positive x-axis in the counterclockwise direction intersects the circle at a single point whose coordinates we define to be cosine theta, sine theta. The units of measure will be important when it comes time to compute derivatives. We'll find it most convenient to measure angle in terms of the length of the arc on the unit circle that it subtends, positive or negative, which is called radian measure. With this definition, the following properties of sine and cosine functions are clear. One, they extend the meaning of sine and cosine as ratios of sides of triangles as they take these values in the first quadrant. Two, sine and cosine are defined for all real numbers. This is because you can wind around the circle as many times as you want in either direction. Three, sine and cosine have range minus one, one. Four, we have the identity for all real numbers sine squared plus cosine squared equals one by the Pythagorean theorem. 5. Sine and cosine are periodic functions with period c, the circumference of the unit circle, meaning the value is the same if we add any multiple of c to the argument, having wound that many times around the circle to the same point. We define the number pi so that c equals 2 pi. Then there are the important angle addition formulas sine x plus y equals sine x cosine y plus sine y cos x, and cosine x plus y equals cos x cos y minus sine x sine y, which I'll discuss in a future video. Finally, the trig functions are differentiable and the derivative of sine is cosine. That's the property I want to focus on. So using the definition of the derivative and the angle sum identity, the derivative turns out to be a linear combination of sine x and cosine x with coefficients expressed as limits we have to compute. So there are a few ways we can dispense with limit cosine h minus 1 over h as h goes to 0. For example, we can manipulate this quantity using identities to reduce the computation to showing that the other limit, sine x over x, exists, and if so, this limit is equal to zero. Note that this depends on a property of the trig functions I haven't mentioned yet, namely that they are continuous. The proof of their continuity will be very similar to an argument I'm about to make. So the real issue is to evaluate this limit, sine h over h, as h goes to zero. I'd say this is usually the first non-trivial theorem proven in a calculus class. This is where the interpretation of the argument to sign as a length really matters. To compute this limit, we have to make a comparison using geometry. We make this diagram to illustrate what's going on for angles near zero in the first quadrant, and the fourth quadrant is similar. Here the length of the segment AC is the value sine h, and we can compare that to the length of the arc BC, which is h by definition. The length of BD is tangent h, since it's the opposite side of a right triangle with adjacent side length 1. So it's possible to infer from this diagram the following two inequalities, which I'll distinguish as two claims. Claim 1, sine h is less than h, or the chord is shorter than the arc. This seems like it must be true since AC is shorter than the segment BC, so it's true as long as the straight line between B and C is shorter than the arc BC along the circle. Setting that aside, claim 2 is that h is less than tan tangent of h. That's plausible, but near this time it's not so obvious how to show that this is true. These inequalities are crucial, and it's the real subject of this video and the next video. Let us, for now, accept them and see how the rest of the calculation goes. If sine h is less than h is less than tangent h for h greater than 0, then we can divide each quantity by sine of h and take reciprocals to find that the function sine h over h is bounded between two continuous functions cosine h and 1. Here's a graph of these functions that illustrates this inequality. The function sine h over h is forced to lie between two continuous functions with common limit 1 at 0, so the limit exists and is equal to 1 by a result usually called the squeeze theorem. For h less than 0, the argument is entirely similar. Therefore, the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. With the limits already computed, we can see that the derivative of cosine is minus sine, whose derivative again 
is minus cosine, et cetera. So we get all the information about the derivatives of these functions and all reciprocals and algebraic combinations by the general rules of the derivative. Very quickly, let me draw a simpler picture that shows how the inequality in claim one is enough to show the continuity of sine and cosine. Here's a diagram showing the differences between sines and cosines separated by a small angle, delta. And let's blow up the key part of that picture. The differences between sines and cosines of nearby angles are the legs of a right triangle, which, if we believe the claim, are both shorter than the arc of length delta. This gives Lipschitz continuity of sine and cosine. So what about those key inequalities that told us sine h is less than h is less than tangent h? They're complicated to prove because they involve comparing straight segments to curved ones on a circle. But that's the whole point of the trig functions. Here, I just want to point out that the first claim is essentially equivalent to the fact that the circumference of a circle is greater than the perimeter of any inscribed polygon, and the second claim is equivalent to the fact that the circumference is smaller than the perimeter of any circumscribed polygon. I wrote the symbol for is implied by, but they're equivalent. Here's a picture of a circle with an inscribed and a circumscribed polygon. Both of these theorems were proven by Archimedes. They're important, but almost never proven in a calculus class. Now, Sometimes I'll see texts or lectures that try to avoid the issue of length comparisons by appealing to inequalities involving areas. Redraw the diagram and observe the triangle OBC is contained in the sector OBC, which is contained in the triangle OBD. Now we, we may now compare areas, since for any notion of area it must be that the area of a region contained in another region is bounded by the area of the larger region. The area of OBC is one half sine h since the altitude is sine h and the base is 1. The area of OBD is 1 half tan h. The area of the sector is h over 2. This is because it's in proportion to the area of the circle as the arc is to the circumference, and the circumference is 2 pi, while the area of the unit circle is pi. With these inequalities, the calculation of the limit goes through as before. It seems we've avoided a subtle length comparison, but actually that's not right. That's because the relationship between the circumference and the area of the circle namely that the area is equal to 1 half CR, where C is the circumference, also first proved by Archimedes, requires a proof that uses the comparison of the circumference of the circle to inscribed and circumscribed polygons. I'm not aware of any other way to establish this relationship without using the fundamental theorem of calculus and the properties of trig functions we're trying to establish in the first place. To get around proving the length comparisons following in the path of Archimedes, some authors start from alternate definitions of the trig functions. With a different definition, you can make calculating the derivative easier, but other properties are harder to establish. And by the way, no one would ever have come up with these definitions to start with. So uh, for example, uh, Spivak, in his calculus textbook, uh, which many people love, waits uh, all the way until chapter 15 to introduce the trig functions uh, after he's proven the fundamental theorem of calculus. That's a long time. Most calculus books introduce the trig functions in chapter one. This way, he can give a definition in terms of areas he has another means to compute. So for a point x in minus 1, 1, he sets a of x to be the area of the sector of the upper semicircle defined by x, given by the signed area of the triangle plus an integral, he defines pi to be twice the area of the whole semicircle and defines cosine theta to be the unique number that gives an area of theta over 2. And sine is defined in this range as square root of 1 minus cosine squared. So this is a different definition. Now you need to derive all the properties from this definition. With the fundamental theorem of calculus, here it's straightforward to take the derivative of cosine just using the inverse function theorem. Extensions of sine and cosine to r have to be imposed to make them periodic, though, first by imposing appropriate reflections over x equals pi, then imposing the 2 pi periodicity, checking that all the derivatives line up. Uh, computing values at special angles, though, is not immediate. Spivak suggests establishing the angle sum identities by noting that, for example, cosine of x plus y as a function of x satisfies the differential equation f double prime plus f equals 0 with initial conditions f of 0 equals cosine of y and f prime of 0 equals minus sine of y, and uses the existence and uniqueness theorem for this equation to get the right linear combination of sine x and cosine x. Then special angles can be recovered by the angle sum identities using cosine pi over 2 equals 0. I think this is ridiculous, as are several other possibilities for defining the trig functions. 
Uh, one could start by defining them as the solutions to this differential equation, y double prime plus y equals zero, the sine having initial conditions y of zero equals zero, y prime of zero equals one, cosine having initial conditions y zero equals one, y prime of zero equals zero. It's possible to show that this equation admits two linearly independent solutions defined on all of R without reference to trig functions, though it requires considerably more machinery even though, than just the fundamental theorem of calculus. The derivatives of sine and cosine are immediate, but the relation sine squared plus cosine squared equals one follows from differentiating the expression y squared plus y prime squared for any solution y of this equation, seeing this as constant, and checking the initial values. One only recovers pi and the periodicity, though, by defining pi here as twice the first positive zero of cosine. You have to use convexity or the sine of the second derivative to show that such a zero of cosine must exist. Or another ill-advised and unmotivated idea is to define sine and cosine in terms of their Taylor series. And with the right theorems about convergence of series, you can show that these expressions make sense for all real numbers. You can show all higher terms cancel to compute sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, formally and algebraically. And differentiating term by term gives that the derivative of sine is cosine, and that both satisfy y double prime plus y equals zero, which reduces establishing their properties to the differential equation definition. Now, how anyone would know to consider such series in the first place is an open question. In my view, all of this is unnecessary and unmotivated. I guess the lesson here is uh, I always prefer to proceed in the most motivated way, just in the most naive way. What is the natural definition? and do whatever it takes to establish what you want, starting from what's in front of you. I don't like these expositions that uh, rewrite history, essentially, uh, to, to make something cleaner at the expense of how would anyone have come up with this in the first place. And all of this to avoid some elementary geometry. Uh, in this video, I guess I highlighted that the, the hard part, the tricky part of calculus is establishing this derivative of the sine function. That's where you really need to compare the lengths of straight segments to the lengths of the arc of a circle, and that's where you use the definition. This is what analysis is really all about, and most people try to avoid it somehow. I highlighted the tricky part, uh, but I didn't prove it. Uh, in the next video, I'll go through what Archimedes did and prove these theorems uh, fully establishing the derivative of the sign. All right, I uh, hope you enjoyed this. Uh, thanks for watching.